Episode 9, Cryonics. You're listening to SpexCast. That's not how it goes. <laughs> Welcome to SpexCast, a podcast for discussing the science and technology of space exploration. I'm Phil, and joining me today, we have TJ. Well, hello. Augie. Hello. And our guest, Cole. Nice to be here. And today, we're going to talk about cryonics. So... First of all, Augie, why don't you take us away with your little segment? Yeah, so I think it'd be cool to try a little news update. Um, It's obviously in beta right now, but we're going to come up with a cool acronym and maybe continue with it in the future. So one big thing that was in the news last week to mark the 55th anniversary of Yuri Gargarian becoming the first ever astronaut in space, Stephen Hawking announced a plan to develop tiny spacecrafts that are set to reach Alpha Centauri. So I thought this was really interesting. It was backed by Russian philanthropist Yuri Milner, and Mark Zuckerberg was involved as well. Their plan is to send a, a huge mothership into orbit and then release thousands of probes that are smaller than the size of your hand. It's like a postage stamp. It's really sweet. Yeah, super, super tiny. And, the, and they essentially will release massive solar sails that are extremely thin and be propelled by a laser on the Earth. Yeah, so going back to our external propulsion thing. Exactly. It's exactly external propulsion. None of this stuff exists right now, but there's no reason it couldn't in the next coming decade. Right, and that's kind of their point. All they do is invest $100 million, and they think it'll cost easily $10 billion to build this, but they're kind of doing a feasibility study because there's no physics roadblocks in their way. Um, and so they think that they could accelerate these tiny crafts up to 20% the speed of light. And Holy since crap. Alpha Centauri is only four and a half light years away, roughly, it would only take a little bit over 20 years to get there, which 20 years is still quite I mean, a long even time. If, even but. if they get there, are they hoping to send back images? Or Yeah, they yeah. want to have a little form of propulsion on the spacecrafts that allow them to kind of turn and beam back um, to the Earth. So what's interesting is you won't be able to slow them down at all once we accelerate them to 20% the speed of light. We don't have a laser on Alpha Centauri, kind of like we talked about with external propulsion on that podcast. No so they're just... About. They're beaming by, but they could hopefully spin around and transmit data back to the Earth. But like, are they talking about images or or other types of? They're they're right now. They're talking about uh, sensors and uh, possibly cameras, but obviously the technology isn't quite there yet. So they're still hoping for advances in. For um, sure. You know, if it, basically they they think that if Morris Law continues over the next decade, and if there's continued advancements in material science and laser technology, right. that this is pretty feasible. Awesome. And uh, if you look at something like the Voyager probes, those were launched in the 70s, and they're still out there transmitting data back to us. So a mission that takes 20 years is well within our lifetime and would be pretty cool because ultimately those could search for life in places far outside of our solar system. Sure. But anyway, that's all I had for the, uh, the news update. And so we're going to move on to our topic, which is cryonics. Um, there are plenty of movies and science fiction out there like Avatar 2001 A Space Odyssey and Interstellar that take advantage of this to transport humans over long distances. Um, So why don't you, Cole, talk a little bit about that um, and how that works. Okay. So can I say something real quick? First of all, sorry, Cole. I just want to say this was kind of inspired by Wait But Why, uh, Tim Urban's article on cryonics is what inspired this conversation. And one thing, I read the article before starting this, and I've been calling it cryogenics for a long time. Cryogenics is just stuff that's really cold. Like cryogenic things use liquid nitrogen, but cryonics is people making people cold. Um, so there is a distinction there. I just for anybody listening, <laughs> I don't want them to go around saying cryogenics and and have that uh, misnomer going. Yeah, on. And okay. that's that's an important distinction that is definitely in Tim Urban's post. So check that out. And that's actually how I met Cole. I'm a TA for one of his classes. And I saw him like reading the article and looking at uh, cryonics in space. So that's how we got talking and inviting him on the podcast. So anyway. Yeah. So uh, that was actually one of the things that got me into the biomedical field was actually reading um, about the different ways we can kind of put humans on pause for space flight. So the uh, topic that um, we are going to cover, which is cryonics, uh, has some basis in today's technology. And that um, is under the guise of tarpur, which is a, stent, a, a state of physical or mental ina- inactivity and lethargy. Um, today, we are experimenting with uh, therapeutic hypothermia um, and uh, uh, feeding through uh, other methods in the mouth. So is that like when, when somebody is really injured and you do you put them 
um, into like a medically induced coma that's that's tarpor? Uh, n- no, this is pretty much uh, only used right now for people uh, whose heart has stopped, but they still have brain activity. Um, the general um, oh, procedure is okay. to uh, cool them down rapidly and to uh, then buy them time for uh, their heart to be restart- uh, restarted. Cool. So it'd be used kind of in an emergency room situation right. where you're waiting for a surgeon or somebody like that to come in and, and do the work? Exactly. Um, now they actually have just started uh, working on uh, this technique for people who come in with gunshot wounds uh, who are bleeding uh, profusely. They drain most or all of their blood and replace it with a cold saline solution. And it allows them to spend an extra three hours in the operating oh, room. Oh, wow, that's trippy. Yeah. That's so trippy. <laughs> and uh, it... Uh, so far, it's actually saved quite a few people's lives. Awesome. Great. That's awesome technology. So the difference between torpor and cryonics then is just that torpor is uh, um, not as cold. So cryonics, uh, at least in the Wait But Why post, it's explained as vitrifying the human body and bringing it down to 196 degrees Celsius, which is just below the boiling point of nitrogen. nitrogen. So you're essentially in a glass-like state. So ideally, you can preserve the human body for an indefinite amount of time. But in the case of torpor, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's just um, cooling the body down slightly, obviously not to a negative 196, um, but to a point where it, it slows down their metabolic processes so that they can, um, you know, have time to, to, re- to resuscitate. Them. So so biology and, and medical stuff is not really my area of expertise. What's the difference? What's, what's vitrify? What does that mean? So vitrify is not necessarily a biology term. It's more like uh, it's... I, maybe you can explain it better. Hold on. I'm yeah. kind of confused as well. So um, what it is, is it's um, actually a physical term. It's used by physicists and it's uh, kind of the state of being glass. So the idea is that if you just froze a person, um, they would die because all of the water in their body would immediately turn to ice. And uh, as we know, ice is um, a lower density than water or liquid water. And uh, all the ice crystals would break all of the membranes of your cells and you would turn into goop. As to avoid (laughs) that, um, they uh, flush your body with this uh, wonderful chemical, which I cannot remember the name of. But what it allows you to do is instead of turning um, the water to ice, it pretty much slows down the uh, actual molecules of water to a point where it is glass. Oh, Uh, wow. So you don't have to deal with any... So it's uh, a solid, but it's not ice. You become glass, pretty much. Oh, that's so cool. Um, so then tarpool, uh, like you were saying, Augie, uh, is uh, better to be related to a type of hibernation. Um, the ideal right now for uh, human spaceflight missions for relatively long duration um, would be on the term uh, time scale of months. And the idea is that you can uh, have the human metabolic rate reduced um, significantly, and it would uh, have a great impact on the mass fraction. Um, required for just crew maintenance. So this is only a technology that would last months, right? I mean, so that would maybe be applicable for a Mars mission, but not necessarily a 20-year plan to Alpha Centauri, correct? Um, Exactly. So you, uh, the people who are uh, following this or pursuing this um, have stated very clearly that uh, they have no plans to extend extend this, uh, extend the sleep period for more than uh, a couple months or half a year, about six months. Um, Is that because they don't think people will wake up from it? Well, with this technique, um, it doesn't become very feasible. The body um, does very much like to be moving. Um, They have to take some interesting shortcuts to get around some of the medical issues. Like the the limbs would atrophy and and things like that. Exactly. Um, They have actually a nice list um, of things that could definitely go wrong. And uh, a few of them are bleeding, infection, uh, infection, uh, electrolyte imbalance. Uh, fatty liver and liver failure, as well as bone demineralization and muscle atrophy. Um, however, they have uh, solutions that they've uh, thought through quite um, well um, for every single one of them. Uh, one of my favorite ones is for the muscle atrophy. They have an automatic, uh, automated physical therapy tool and a neuromuscular electrical stimulator. So it works out for you? I need one of those. <laughs> <laughs> has that technology been tested at all yet? Um, it actually has. Uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, um, just released a uh, video um, showing um, electrodes controlling a muscle of 
Oh, um, so they zap it into flexing and unflexing and exercising it externally? Exactly. So oh, could I physical. work out while I sleep? That's the idea. Oh my God. Don't skip leg day. <laughs> so there's this technology has actually been around for a while, just not in that full kind of flex mode. So even in like high school sports, we had a device to attach electrodes to whatever area and it will basically uh, cause very small contractions across the muscles. They use it mainly for therapeutic reasons instead of like whole limb kind of accutations. Uh, but that's been uh, used in Russia, I know, for 20, 30 years. And it's just kind of gained popularity here. I don't know how long, probably been more than 10 years. So going from that small scale kind of uh, thing to a full body exercise is probably that next big leap. So that's sort of a massage tool then? Is what it was Yeah, so for one I used personally, it was all just massage, muscle relaxation. Yeah. Where did you use it? Uh, in high school, uh, when I did high school sports, basically you cut, you know when you get that tingling sensation yeah. in your hand, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It feels just like that. Um, a little warm sometimes. Oh, it's not. It's not really a big issue. Tell but, you me know, more. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, you just put it on. You know, a specific muscle could be want, and twenty thirty minutes later, you'll take it off, and there is definitely a noticeable uh, relaxation effect. Um, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know exactly why. That's cool. Yeah, it's, it seems like it's definitely within reach of today's researchers as well. And that's exactly why it's been getting NASA funding is because it's not necessarily uh, inventing anything new. It's just combining a bunch of pre-made systems into one, uh, hopefully, space flight ready system. Yeah. So I guess it's interesting. Uh, it's only going to be a nine month flight if you, you know, if you time it right, it could be even shorter. But if if we've already sent humans up to space for longer, like Scott Kelly has been there for a year, really the only benefit of doing something like this would be to save on mass that it takes to transport in the capsule to Mars. And you mean you mean mass in terms of food and water and things? Exactly. exactly, yeah. So if you decrease their metabolic rate, then they're consuming less food, they're consuming less water, and they don't need recreational activities on the ship. So they wouldn't need to be running around and, you know. You'd also have a psychological issue that NASA, I know, brings up a lot and they're concerned that yeah. if you have people together all in one small space, that Especially small groups, exactly, it can cause them to break down. I actually read a book about, about it recently, um, kind of about that isolation. It was called Endurance and it was about this uh, explorer named Shackleton who in the 19, early 1900s uh, tried to sail to uh, Antarctica and, and cross it. By and himself? Um, he had a big crew of like 30 people and they got stranded there for over a year. And it's basically a great case study of what can happen um, when, you know, you're stranded with the same people over and over again. Like um, a real life Lord of the Flies? <laughs> truly, yeah. Yeah, except in a much more brutal and harsh condition, kind of similar to what maybe Mars would be or what, uh, um, I mean, obviously... Mars is going to be even worse than Antarctica, but at the same time, it's a good case study from the psychological perspective. And it actually, without ruining the book or anything, it, it went pretty well for them. Is that that's good news for for Mars missions, right? It definitely is, yeah. But I think too, it's it, and NASA recognizes this. It's very dependent on the people you have, so they have to be very careful when they choose astronauts. They have to be very careful when they choose uh, really a anybody that's going to be an explorer that goes out and is stuck with their, their crewmates for a certain amount of time. Yeah. So as Augie and Cole mentioned, the main convenience or use of this technology is reducing the consumables. And that is, it doesn't seem like a big issue, but it you really does. So when you're looking at uh, a, mar or a lunar mission, right? Three days there, roughly three days back. Six, seven days in space. You need six, seven days of water, food. You need places to store waste or process waste. And that was, you know, pushing the extremes in 1969. Now with the ISS, we have much better uh, recycling programs and waste removal uh, techniques, but it's still nowhere near 100% efficiency. It's not even 90% efficiency, right? So when you're looking at going to Mars, which six months or longer, depending on your trajectory, then you're bringing six months worth of food. And NASA's done studies on how much food a human needs per day, how much water, how much air. I mean, it's and all moot when you, if you feed someone through an IV that's locked in a chamber. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you could just feed them a lot less. Yeah. You, so you can feed them a lot less, which is, you know, how you 
how this technology benefits. But for six months, it's like, yeah, you're talking about hundreds of tons of food for a person. But then when you want to go to the outer solar system, Mar uh, Jupiter, Saturn, go to one of the moons out there, then it's years. Right. And so there's two main uh, kind of fields of research in being able to be more sustainable, which goes along with producing food. Right. We're just on the beginnings of producing our own food in space, growing some plants on the ISS uh, and then recycling programs to benefit that. And the other way is through cryonox and Tapor, reducing the per unit time use of those resources. Right. Both are, are going to be essential for sure. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about, about cryonics. We're kind of doing an Venturing overview. There, yeah, but... let's get into the specifics. Sure. Uh, so cryonics uh, right now has um, uh, is more of a niche um, in our culture. Uh, there's not necessarily a, um, it's not accepted as a, uh, as something that everyone does yeah. after. I read, uh, in, I read in the Wait But Why article, there's like 300 people in the world that are currently, are they vitrified? Yep. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're vitrified. They're currently in nitrogen vats, just hanging out there and they're waiting until the technology that we have is good enough, not only to wake them back up, but, but to cure, cure whatever ailment they were dying from. Right. So like as they were dying before, before they were completely dead, they went to a company that um, does cryonics and they preserved themselves. Right. Yeah. So bef before they die, long before you go, you go to this company, um, there's, there's a few of them. One is called Elcor and you say, I would like to be uh, cryonically preserved and you pay, you know, a monthly fee or a big heavy flat rate. And that essentially says that when I die, the moment I actually die on earth, so you don't need to die early or anything like that. Um, they will essentially vitrify your body and put you in a big nitrogen vat. And every week they will top off that nitrogen and just keep going and going. And they have a big trust fund set up in case the company goes out of business. So that will hopefully continue for the very long foreseeable future. Yeah, but hopefully the astronauts we put on, on these big spacecraft aren't dying or almost dead. So, um, Absolutely. But yeah, we only have the only real test cases we have currently are these 300 almost dead people. Right? Pretty, Pretty much. much, yeah. And I mean, there's some interesting studies with animals. They recently... Uh, uh, used cryonics to preserve a uh, rabbit kidney, and then they were able to revive it, bring it back, and uh, put it in a rabbit, and it still worked fine. Interesting. So that that was interesting. Okay, sorry, sorry to derail the conversation. Okay. Cool. No, so um, I think that uh, Alcor and CI, the uh, Cryonics Institute, those are the two companies that really have um, status right now. Uh, are both using the same technique of putting people in vats with their heads at the bottom and uh, topping them off with uh, nitrogen. Right. Now, it's actually kind of an interesting uh, concern when you uh, apply this to space flight. Um, with the fluid dynamics in zero gravity or oh, yeah. reduced gravity, zero you're gonna, you start getting some uh, interesting issues uh, with that. And that's something that I don't necessarily have a solution for, but one that uh, definitely needs to be considered for any... Uh, uh, future plans. So they put them in the tanks right now. They put them in the tanks upside down, like head at the bottom, so the head is the last thing to thaw if something should thaw. Yeah. yeah so if something goes wrong and somebody forgets to top off the tank or something like they that, just lose their um, feet. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of the premise there. But in zero G, it's kind of like a big gloopy bubble thing, unless you keep it under a vacuum. I guess. Well, I would wonder if you could just constantly accelerate. So if you're going to go to Mars, ah, if on your trip, you constantly accelerate. And then when you get to, you know, a certain point, you flip around and accelerate the other direction, basically to decelerate your spacecraft before landing on Mars. I mean, I'm sure there, like, then, if we did consider the acceleration of the engines long term, you could have like a thing that's like a gyroscope thing that always points the head in the downward right. direction. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, so zero G in space is always a really big, big challenge, challenge. Um, um, with, especially with fuel. So like with current cryonics, you have that tank of liquid nitrogen and, and rocket, rocket engineers have been having to deal with the exact same situation with liquid oxygen, liquid uh, hydrogen, and all their fuels, which are all relatively yeah, uh, like cold. It means another fuel. Right. And once you get into space and you're not thrusting with the engine. It's, it's just floating in there. SpaceX has a lot of really cool videos of inside the liquid oxygen tank once the second stage shuts down and it all starts flowing through there. And there are mechanical ways of actually constraining that fluid uh, to the inlet is what you know the critical goal is. And you can actually use the um, surface tension of the liquid itself 
to basically keep its pull itself together and have it stay where uh, to the inlet. Uh, there's mechanical bladders where you basically have your tank and then an internal bladder, and then you pump a gas into that to now take up the room um, uh, that the ex- the expended fuel used to occupy, and you just fill up that space with something else so that your desired fuel is where you want it to be, right? Yeah, yeah. and you can also do um, different kind of baffles that work with the surface tension to pretty much pull it down there. And then, uh, obviously, the one that most, not most, but a lot of people use is thrusters, right? They'll do a brief RCS burst, pushes all the fuel to the inlet, and then the main engine starts, and you don't have an issue. I guess you but, can spin people, too. Like that whole idea for artificial gravity. All you need is a little bit of acceleration to keep it all in one, all the liquid mm-hmm. in one spot. And then you get to the problems like how much uh, hardware is each person going to start requiring? Oh, and I mean, it that, might get cost prohibitive. And- exactly. So, I mean, probably not uh, anywhere near how much uh, hardware would be needed if they were fully alive and functioning. Um, but, you know, it's always, you know, looking at the math. Right? Yeah, these are things I never even considered when I, when I first thought of cryogenics because that's how uneducated I was. But all this cryonic stuff, it's way more complex than just dropping somebody in liquid nitrogen. Sure. Is there a huge, like, involved process for cooling people down or do they just slowly lower them into the nitrogen? I mean, there's, oh, you insert the stuff into their veins, right? Yeah, so that that's the first step. And if you look at the Wait But Why post, that's really where we got a lot of our information from because Tim Irvin really goes through and, and he cites papers and stuff like that. And uh, some of these companies have machines that they will hook you up to, uh, hopefully right after you die, like within minutes or hours. Um, and so they'll essentially replace your veins with something else because your body is 70% water. So if they were to freeze that, uh, the water would expand and it would burst all your organs. So if all that test fluid that vitrifies you, yeah, like you still have exposed, you know, your eyes, your your skin, um, your esophagus, like all these right. outside parts to your body, does the vitrifi- vitrification still protect those parts of your body? So it's designed to just protect your body through the you know, freezing process when you put them in the liquid nitrogen and you get down to extremely cold temperatures. But right now, that question really hasn't been answered. There's um, Nobody's actually been revived from these uh, cryonic systems because we don't have that capability yet. And the process of reviving, um, Cole, maybe you can talk about that. How do you... How do you how do you anticipate warm. that this would happen in yeah. the future if they do get the technology? I mean, sure, let's speculate. Why not? We've done it before. We'll do it again. I mean, the whole field of cryonics is pretty much speculation right now, too. Exactly. And uh, the Post uh, has some wonderful graphs and uh, other illustrations that uh, show the different uh, possibilities. Um, but pretty much uh, its most informative one is uh, some type of graph that looks kind of like a supply and demand uh, graph. And it has pretty much the, uh, you know, challenge of revival um, crossed with the capabilities of revival technology. And pretty much the people who are getting uh, vitrified right now are people who uh, very much believe in Moore's Law and its impact on uh, the rest of technology. So they're really looking at that exponential growth of technology. Um, so right now we don't have a very good way to revive people, um, especially because they are by our, uh, our standards dead already. Um, so the, uh, when you go into cryonic, uh, storage or sleep, whichever one you want to say, um, you're betting that they can not only, uh, wake you up, they can reverse the effects of cryonics, but they can also cure you and pretty much, um, you're you're betting that the disease you went in with is uh, won't won't get complicated by the cryonic story. Right. That's for that's for like these people, and that's kind of all we have to go on right now. But for space exploration, these can potentially be the most healthy people we have on Earth. Right. Do you think they'd be more likely to? So right now we we neither have the capability to wake the people up nor cure the ailments that they died. So you mean wake them up as in wake them up from the dead state or wake them up up from from the cryonics? 
So there's no way right now that we have to bring people down to negative 196 degrees Celsius and wake them up and have them actively function. And one, one big bottleneck to that, though, is you can't generally test that on people. Even if someone had a system to do that, you, you can't test it on animals, but it's it will be a, a challenge um, seeing this technology come to fruition without them you know, being on the verge of death first anyway. Can I, because a lot of healthy people aren't going to sign up to be the first test subjects. I just want to say this. I, I'm seeing, I just watched um, the Discovery series when we left Earth. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's basically uh, a documentary miniseries um, that Discovery did on the Mercury um, and Gemini, like all the way up to Apollo. And I'm seeing a lot of parallels today. Like, for example, um, SpaceX landing on the autonomous drone ship is a huge step and it's super exciting and very inspiring. And I'm seeing parallels to like um, the Mercury miss mission, for example, where everybody is super excited and paying attention to this. Maybe the next, you know, actual Mercury mission where they didn't know if this astronaut was going to live or not. Maybe that's like the first cryonics test we do. And then the Apollo landings, instead of landing on the moon, we land on Mars. I'm seeing a lot of parallels here. And it's, it's just a, what a time to be alive. <laughs> it's very exciting. Yeah. And I definitely don't think, uh, and, I, and I know all the people in this field don't think that um, this, uh, everyone should wait to go to Mars before this technology has been, uh, you know, perfected because it will take more time uh, than when the earliest Mars missions uh, plan to go. And I think Mars is close enough that even with that um, enlarged uh, mass fraction and extended time in space, we've already kind of proven that we, we could do it, but I, Mars is kind of like the limit until we figure this out. However, they have been thinking ahead. Oh, and well, they that's a great place to pause. TJ has to, has to go. Everybody say bye, TJ. Bye, TJ. Bye, TJ. Um, we'll pick up as soon as he leaves. All right, you want to continue, Cole? Where were we? Yes. Yeah, so uh, we just talked about how uh, it doesn't make sense for us to wait for this technology of tarpool or cryonics to go to Mars. We have uh, generally the technology we need to kind of do a flag and footprints on Mars. However, tarpool is thinking ahead. They're looking at the possibility of colonization and what that would require. They actually have PowerPoints and papers uh, that are on the subject of how to make a hundred person uh, colonization vessel wow. that go to Mars. To go to like the transport vessel? That, yes. Um, I'm actually looking at their PowerPoint right here. And uh, it uh, has modules that uh, if you envision the Bigelow uh, B330. The um, inflatable habitat that was just uh, tested on the space station carried by, carried by a SpaceX Dragon. Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, Same orbital rocket that landed on the drone ship. But that Bigelow habitat that they launched isn't the 330, right? The one that they launched was just a smaller test version that's currently docked oh. in the initial space station. Sorry about that. So this is like a much bigger version that Bigelow eventually wants to test, kind of like their own space station. Yes. Um, and the beam, uh, which it's called, is the Bigelow Expandable, not Inflatable, Activities Module. <laughs> Ooh, which, so much room for activities. <laughs> exactly. So uh, if you imagine what the B330 um, or the Bigelow 330 and the 330 is given by the volume it will have. 330 what? I think it's, oh shoot, I think it's cubic meters, but I'm not, not sure. Okay. Or not cubic meters, it wouldn't be cubic meters. Yeah. Maybe. Um hope it would be bigger than that if we're so, so but uh then you have two maybe. Of, you have two of these um and right now i think uh they're uh putting them in uh in series uh and then attaching them to what they have uh labeled as a uh a, a fission power module um hand wavy it's going to it's going to be pulled there <laughs> and it's going to be like a train full of people exactly however as we've uh said th it does not uh, require a speedy six month uh trajectory to mars right. uh, so it can you know take some nice electric uh propulsion like a vasmir or whatnot um well, well so the thing with mars is it's so close and if you can get there 
in well relatively and if you can get there in six months wouldn't you rather do that than spend years and having your family grow and age and it then depends. you're on another planet it depends what back. if you what if you're also telling a bunch of the stuff that they need to live and be your thrust to weight ratio is just super low and it just takes that long to get there so i think that this kind of system with the uh you know the electric propulsion or the solar sail or something like that where you can bring heavy masses for that would for be low, separate that, that would maybe be separate from the human systems. I just think that with the technology for Torpor to go some, somewhere as close as Mars, no one would really want to do that. And it maybe isn't the most ideal system because if you're trying to have, like inhabit Mars, you're going to need tons of mass on Mars already there for you to inhabit and work with. Is, so you already need to figure out a low cost way to get the mass there. Is, so Bigelow, I, is Bigelow designing this in their paper? Do they mention specifically Mars? Because I, I see like... Maybe this is their, you know, they design this and they scale it back for Mars and then now they're ready to go virtually anywhere, right? What if we want to go to Venus and have in atmosphere habitat zones? We can talk to Anthony later about that. He wrote a paper on it. But aren't these habitat zones, correct me if I'm wrong, Cole, but these are all about uh, Torpora. So no one wants to live in a, a Venus orbiting habitat that no, they're I mean, to get, frozen in. To get them someplace that takes longer than six months. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that. That could make sense, I think. Yeah. And the way that they talk about this in the paper is this would be kind of the economy class. You know, you got people oh, in first class okay. first class who might be using up a ridiculous amount of fuel mm -hmm. to bring that six months, you know, burn down to maybe three months by, you know, using absorbent amounts of right. uh, propellant. So if you can use a cheaper uh, method of propulsion, like, I don't know, electric or free solar energy, whatever, solar pressure then that, that'll bring down the cost and you can get more people. And that's why they have this extendable 100-person modules that you can stack up next to each other. Exactly. And what, they're, uh, what it looks like they're hoping to do is uh, have better radiation protection. Because everyone's sleeping, they don't need as much room. So you can really layer a bunch of water. So like my neighbor would be a radiation barrier for me? Uh, the Bigelow habitats, they actually store their water used in the spacecraft. As a radiation all, shield. Yes. Right. So the people drink the stuff that's protecting them. Yes. And then yep. it's recycled. But then you can whatever. filter that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. And that actually, I think, makes a lot of sense, especially for Mars transport capabilities, to, to surround yourself with water, because we already know it's a great radiation shielder. Exactly. All that hydrogen really makes it uh, quite a good shock absorber. Um, so it also uh, should be known that their... Um, uh, proposal also has a uh, crew habitat for the people who are awake and moving. They and operating the ship while it's running. Exactly. They said they'd have four crew. So yeah. if this uh, actually gets uh, pulled into fruition, you might actually have a job as a uh, <laughs> space flight uh, crewman. Bringing this back to the small groups, kind of people going insane theory, would the people that are manning the ship rotate out of tar in and out of Tarpor? with themselves like you bring a crew of 16 group a is awake for the first leg first quarter you know and then 25 percent of the way through they go to tarpool and the next people when the next people are woken up um do you think that's what they're doing or does that proposal say these people are awake the whole journey um they said that they'd be awake the entire journey um i think this one uh this proposal had a little bit of a uh interesting future vision that if these people wanted to, they could just stay in space for their entire life. Oh. And, you know, you don't have to deal with bone uh, you know, demineralization if you're just going to hang out in zero G the so entire time. So if you're never going to come back to the Earth, you don't care if you can walk on Earth. Yeah, that was That's kind an of interesting the general thought. perspective. And of course, they could step off on Mars, which has, what, a third right. the gravity. So Everybody skips leg day. <laughs> I think I would actually trust the system more as a passenger if there were four active crew members the entire time rather than having four groups in series that do 25 percent of the work I, I think i'd be a bit more nervous that all those groups come together and work well enough um than, you than know one I mean? group going insane well i think that if it's only going to be what two years even if you take the slowest path so um only. i think I mean, that's a while, but four people that are trained and I can meet them as a passenger. Well, first off, I don't think if I go to Mars, it will be in some sort of cryopreserved manner. I don't, I don't think that 
in our future, at least for Martian travel, that we will need Torpor, we'll need any of these systems to go. Would, um, Would you feel safer if it was like an automated robot and everything was set up in a way that not much could go wrong? Or would you still want humans there in case things happened? Cole, you want to? So actually, uh, the group that's doing the space works, their first paper on the subject was for a six person mission to Mars. And no one was awake the entire time and only a robotic arm, which doubled as the uh, muscle stimulator. Uh, was the thing keeping track of it. And of course, they had an entire mission control back on Earth, uh, you right. know, looking at everything that they were doing, or not doing, really. So like an artificial intelligence, or just everything that happens is so um, well like planned out that it can maintain these people's uh, cryonic state and drive the ship? Yeah, this first one was assuming that these people are the first person people to go to Mars, and each one of them could have a doctor on Earth that's just looking at their own uh, vital signs. So, and then direct know, the, the robotic arm. Exactly. Uh, the scaled up version, the one with 100 people uh, going to Mars, they, they decided to ditch that. And they have robotic arms doing the stimulation and kind of the general maintenance to make sure um, that the people don't right. uh, get infections and whatnot. Right. They still uh, have your crewmen. But the crewmen are the ones who deal with anything that gets a little bit out of hand. They don't. Right. You don't have to deal with a robotic arm uh, having to suddenly figure out what to do if someone goes into a cardiac arrest or gets an aneurysm or whatnot. Would you rather... This is, I always like to throw in a few fun questions. Augie, you already kind of said what you'd want to do, but Cole, would you prefer to be on a long-term voyage, cryonics, and go someplace far away? Or be awake the whole time and go to Mars? Or short-term tarpor or what? Um, I personally think some of the coolest celestial objects are pretty darn far away from the sun. Um, we just got pictures from Pluto uh, yeah. a few months ago, and that was amazing. Um, I know Titan, Enceladus, and all those uh, planets out there past the uh, asteroid belt are just kind of some of the most beautiful ones uh, we have uh, taken pictures of so far. Uh so yeah, I think uh, TARP will go in for six months stints and maybe a month off. So, you know, six months in, a month out, um, going on and off. So you still get to experience the fun, the adventure of zero gravity, but without the uh, extreme boredom. And, yeah, extreme boredom, I would imagine. Uh, you know, possible psychological effects of being stuck with the same people. for Yeah, and like I was thinking about this um, when I asked the question, like, would I want to be awake for the whole time going to Mars? And I, I've, okay, so the space station has um, cameras that live stream views of Earth from the space station constantly. And there's actually a week where I watched that more than I actually worked um, when I was at work. And I was just sitting there staring at it. And views from space are incredible. And I love them. I always pick the window seat on an airplane. You know, I love watching uh, what's out there. But um, oh, I forget the artist's name, but there was an artist that just released a video that has realistic time scales and starts at the sun and zooms out at light speed. And it takes 43 minutes for that zoom out effect at light speed to reach Jupiter because that's how long it takes light to reach Jupiter. And I, I couldn't do it. I had to skip forward. And I couldn't watch the whole thing. So I think I would do the same thing. Probably, I mean, let's just be awake for the landing and, and the takeoff. Because then you get to see Earth, you get to see the moon, and then you get to see Mars. And in between, it's just blackness. So, I mean, the interesting stuff. But I guess you have less control that way, too. It is it is a lot of blackness, and it's it would be a lot less interesting from a window viewing perspective than the International Space Station because you're not constantly looking down at your ever changing Earth. You're just out there going and going. Um, but I would want to be awake for it just because I would want a big spaceship, something much bigger than the ISS, and I'd want to meet people and interact with people. Also, like a like a traveling colony ship where yeah. you're not just sitting there floating, taking down measurements, sitting in a chair. You want to be like doing activities in zero g and conversing with 
potentially hundreds of people. Yeah, heck yes. A hundred people have a chat. I mean, you're not going to know everybody uh, before you take off. I mean, you might have met them all, but you're not going to know them on sort of a, a stronger level. And if that's the people that you're, you know, building a colony with on Mars, because if you're sending a hundred people there, they're probably going to colonize it. You, you'd, it'd be nice to meet those people in advance and you have, you know, six months to a year of travel. Uh, it's, it's a long time, but it's not that long. It's not something I don't think is impossible for a hundred people to, you know, get along and, and make it. I mean, obviously you want to have precautions in case something is to happen, but I would rather be awake for it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, I was just thinking, you know, if your, you know, goal in the long run is the only reason you do star pool is because, you know, you're, you might be trying to reduce psychological uh, impacts, but it's definitely for the mass fraction. You're trying to get back uh, some of that mass that's used up on people. And, you know, one of the different ways to do that is to build a world class or for all we know, you know, galactic class life support system that is able to, you know, recycle everything. In that case, you know, who needs to be, you know, all, you know, cooled down when, you know, everything that you do yeah. uh, doesn't really impact. I feel like at that supplies. point, people that would be chilled and in chambers would be treated like cargo. And that's kind of an unsettling thought, you know, to unload people in in crates of cryogenic tanks. That's scary. <laughs> Definitely. But uh, the, uh, you know, one of the other solutions might be is, uh, you know, to avoid some of the psychological uh, impacts is using virtual reality. Um, I don't Ooh. think everyone's done that. Uh, I think while I've heard is they've done a cool idea. they've done AR augmented reality in space on the space station. They've never done virtual reality, and I can't even imagine how amazing that might feel. Zero G virtual reality for six months. Uh, yes, sir. Sign me up. That sounds cool. So, so that might be uh, an interesting way to kind of uh, mediate some of the psychological effects. Um, but you definitely won't be getting unloaded in vats for with Tarpur because you got some pretty long needles uh, put up. Uh, oh yeah, in your in your body, and you don't want those to jiggle around. So for <laughs> anything that uh, re requires acceleration uh, or in in constant acceleration, you will be unplugged and awake. Right. So I think this kind of stuff is more applicable for longer term, longer duration uh, space flight. So maybe to go to Alpha Centauri, you know, if we send these nano crafts and years. eventually send some human made system, maybe we'll be ready to do that in twenty years. Um, that's when I would think that the cryonics or the torpor would make sense. So I'm curious, how long do do the scientists think that torpor could sustain somebody? Uh, exactly. So um, what, uh, like I said a little bit before, they aren't really looking anywhere past six months because... So they're not even considering it because we don't know how? Well, because there are better ways to do it if you want to go longer than six months. Oh, okay. uh, right now, they're just thinking about putting someone in an artificially uh, hypothermic state which will uh, lower their heart rate, r lower their metabolic, um, you know, rate. Um, however, um, if you're going to go anywhere f further than that, if you're going on the span of years, um, they're going to want to really, uh, well, they're going to want to reduce the metabolic rate even further. And in order to do that, you're going to have to start looking uh, other places. Um, so, so not a deep freeze, but just maybe probably something else entirely. Um, exactly. Yes. So right now they're looking at more of a temperature based, uh, lowering the core temperature and as a result, lowering the metabolic uh, rate. However, there are uh, drug and chemical based uh, methods of doing this, as well as uh, brain syna uh, synapse based, uh, syna synapse based uh, methods. And if uh, neurotechnology keeps on um, advancing at the pace that DARPA really hopes it will, um, we're going to have some very interesting ways to manipulate uh, the human brain in the next 10 years. So really quickly, how would manipulating brain synapses and people's consciousness effectively um, help preserve their bodies? Are you just mean like transfer consciousness to something else or what? Well, that's, that might be a little bit farther out than, the, yeah. than what I'm looking at the 10 year scale. But uh, we have to remember that the brain is the control center for the body. So if you're able to tell the brain, hey, can you maybe breathe once every minute? and beat the heart once every minute oh. uh, that'd be pretty sweet do that for you know six months i thought you were gonna say tell the brain everything is fine <laughs> everything is fine <laughs> <laughs> interesting and and those are sort of 
white paper phase? Like people are just talking about the ideas or have there been ex- preliminary experiments? The chemical methods have been uh, experimented with. Uh, in 2011, uh, the University of Alaska successfully induced hibernation uh, by uh, hydrogen sulfide um, in ground squirrels. Um, so ground squirrels, if you don't already know, they have uh, hibernation tendencies. So they hibernate uh, naturally, but they were able to figure out a way to induce it and induce it a little bit deeper than normal. And so they were able to kind of extend uh, the hibernation. So, you know, once you get into the point of, you know, humans wanting to go pretty far in space, you're probably going to be genetically modifying humans to be able to live better to in that space. Squir- that have that hibernation gene and then predispose the space traveling, like, the space travelers to be, uh, what do you call it, preconditioned to be ready for and equipped for a space, long-term space flight. Exactly. I mean, you know, a few of the modifications that you might do is just you know, stop the uh, blood from congregating in the head. You know, our, our body has evolved to pump uh, blood up, uh, you know, right. to our head because gravity is always fighting it. Um, if you're able to kind of negate that, I so, mean, in zero G, that's not the, that's not the case at all, right? Well, <laughs> our body still does it, and that's why all of our astronauts have heads that are about you know maybe an eighth as large as they uh, an eighth larger than they are on Earth because all the blood just congregates on the head. As a result, you know the eyes get damaged. Um, so there are definitely a couple of modifications that you might look into uh, if you wanted to really make humans ready for long term. Uh, space missions and space colonization. Awesome. This stuff is super cool. Yeah. Did you have any, anything else you wanted to mention, Cole? Uh, oh, so just going uh, quickly into how uh, cold they go, um, how cold Tarpool takes the person and how quickly. Um, so the procedure they have is they try to reach a target temperature of around 89 degrees Fahrenheit um, and uh, at a rate of one degree per hour. So that'll take about six hours. 89 degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. So they're not cooling it's you not too much. That cold, no, they're, they're just inducing That's hypothermia. Warm. I mean, oh, you, oh, you mean the body temperature is 97? Right? Yeah. Or whatever, 98? Yeah. I don't even know. Mechanical. Yeah, yeah, so it's... You're, you're cold, but in relation to most things in life, it's still pretty hot. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, but it's enough to uh, significantly reduce the metabolic intake um, by about half. Oh, wow. Um, so the rewarming process, uh, you're going to be rewarming back to body temperature about 97 at a rate of one to four degrees per hour. And that'll take about two to eight hours. So they ran through some, you know, scenarios where the computer really does not know what to do. Maybe lost uh, contact with mission control and uh, decided to wake up a few people pretty quickly. Um, Yeah, uh, that's not bad at all. No. Two hours, two to eight hours to wake up. Interesting. I thought they would have gotten down way, way colder than that. I don't know. But thinking in your core body it's like the opposite of a fever what 100 110 degrees can be lethal or something like that yeah even 106 can be lethal too so that's what eight degrees up subtract a few degrees this opposite direction like go the opposite direction yeah, a few you're, degrees and you're essentially inducing hypothermia but I, I found it interesting that you said it only decreases your metabolic rate by 50 percent. So for long term, you know, 20 plus year space travel, um, you were right when you said there are better methods, or at least not better methods now, but better methods to look into maybe something like cryonics, where you're really going down to those low, low, low temperatures and reducing your metabolic rate to nearly zero. Exactly, exactly. Um, But yeah, the the future of human spaceflight is very bright. Yeah. (laughs) Awesome. Or also very cold. Very cold. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so that's the end of episode nine. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with another discussion on space exploration, science, and technology. If you want to share your thoughts on cryonics, or if you have requests for another discussion topic, send an email to specscast at gmail.com or tweet to us at RIT Specs. If you want to hear more, consider subscribing to us through iTunes or your favorite podcast app. All past episodes are also available to download from our website. This podcast is made possible by RIT Specs, a space exploration student faculty research organization at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Special thanks to the Interactive Learning Grant Program for giving us the tools to promote student and faculty engagement outside the classroom. Our music is by Kevin Hartnell. This has been SpecsCast. We'll see you next week.